So it's been a while since I made a video, and I suppose a sort of update, I want to talk about some of the books that I've been been reading recently. And I say, I say recently, but really it's the, the past few months that I've been looking at these books, and primarily they are focusing on history, although there is a non-fiction book in there. However, there are three that look at the classical histories, so the Cudides, the Peloponnesian War, Polybius's The Histories, and Herodotus's The Histories as well. They were sort of all following him from each other. So I believe the order is going from Herodotus to Thucydides and then to Polybius. Sort of, and that's really the transition from the ancient Greek world, or the ancient Greek and the Persian world, into the, the Roman world. Then moving a bit further forward, but still maintaining some of the classical ideals, is Paul, Streth Paul Strethon's The Medicis. Then going even further forward to the Russian Revolution, Russian Revolution and Civil War by Anthony Beaver, and the state and revolution by Vladimir Lenin. Then the history book, or the fiction book, is The Three Musketeers by Alexandre Dumas. And as sort of is typical when I'm reading books, I don't necessarily care much about the the narrative structure. The narrative structure, sort of this happens and this happens and this happens. I'm not so drawn to that, that's not what sticks with me once I've read a book. Obviously I want to be able to sort of recount the story if it's a fiction book, or understand a sequence of events. But what was more interesting are the themes that jumped out of it, and particularly from these seven books. And for me, while reading them, it was talking about culture, how cultures are created, where they come from, how history informs our culture. But then another idea surrounding chaos and suffering, and how that can give birth to a culture, as perhaps it did in terms of the Renaissance in Florence, and how it can destroy a culture, if we look at the Russian Revolution. And trying to sort of understand why chaos can be creative but also why chaos can be destructive and the more you sort of delve into that and if we take the archetypal view that chaos is linked to the feminine where masculinity is linked to order we can see how nature particularly if we take then the feminine to mother nature can be both creative and also destructive and having that balance between the two and the exploration of that creative and destructive force in history but also in all facets of life. Then the second area was really looking at the morality, particularly coming from the classical sources. So how ancient Greeks, now ancient Rome, thought about morality, thought about what it meant to be a good citizen, a good person within your family, and then how that then continued going into the the Medici's, the attempt to revive that, and the first short instance where we look at the idea of a gentleman, and how people should conduct themselves and act in public and in private settings. The Three Musketeers very much links into that, this idea of chivalry, this idea of being a a good man, but having that duality of man. If we look at all the different characters, or if we look at the four Musketeers, including D'Artagnan, and we see the dualities within them, the love of poetry, the wanting to fight, the attachment to the church, but then also the chasing women and the drinking and the gambling, looking there that we had those two sides of masculinity as well, as we had the chaos in terms of the suffering and the creative aspect in terms of feminine. But really focusing on the morality and how it meant to, to live and be good and how those ideas have developed. Looking at history more so than looking at a philosopher, because you can really learn just so much, whether it's Plato and Aristotle, or the three historians mentioned for the classical books. And then the third aspect was death. And really this might tie into culture, but it's sort of an annex, because it's looking at how we treat death, how we celebrate death, how we mourn death, and the different rituals that were created in ancient Rome, the ones that the Soviets then tried to create to build a new culture. And it's very interesting to see how a culture understands and deals with death, whether they have any rituals, any process for mourning, where in the West we, we don't really have that. We have a, an aversion to death, a want to, to look away, to pretend it doesn't necessarily exist and we don't have any way then of dealing with it is it suddenly just hits us and if something takes you by surprise it's very deal very difficult to to manage it but nevertheless going back to the idea of culture and particularly because they are histories and when you look at the ancient histories there's no the veracity of them how truthful they are is very difficult to gauge particularly if you sort of take for example the books around alexander the great the contemporary ones although they were in in some instances, a long time afterwards. But considering what is legend, what is myth, and what is true, 
But taking it from a classical standpoint of citizens living at that time, it didn't necessarily matter what was true and what wasn't. It was more the spirit and the idea of these histories, of these myths and legends, that was an attempt to make people strive for more, to be better, to have this perfectional or this per perfect ideal of a hero. And then it's your job and your challenge to try and reach that, although it's completely impossible. But that's not to say that the process and the attempt of getting closer is not worth it and still, I suppose, beating yourself up, even though you're not really getting there. So there's this element of inspiration that comes from the histories, but then also there's an element of this is how you learn. We can't live out every single idea that we want to pursue. How we look in history, if we look at the misfortunes of other of others, but also their fortunes, we can begin to structure a life. We can begin to identify with characters in history, see this is what they had a tendency to do, this is what made them fail, this is what made them successful. And we almost run simulations throughout this. I think you get the same benefit from reading fiction. I think you get the same benefit from daydreaming and imagining what your future will be like. But it's a very important aspect that humans have over any other animal in the sense that we can run simulations. We can predict how the future might go. How good our predictions are it depends on how much we know, how much information we have. And one source of that information is, is coming from history. Then, it's like tying this back into the death aspect, we see in Polybius's histories that there was a strange tradition that when a notable family member would die, a mask would be made of their face in very close likeness. And at the funeral, family members would come up and they would proclaim their virtues. They would only focus on the virtues. And then that mask would be taken, it would be put as an icon in a shrine in the house, and on festivals and holy days it would be decorated and it would be worshipped and celebrated. And then again, when another family member died, the person who had the most likeness in terms of build and appearance to the mask of the dead family member would wear that mask and attend the funeral. And we see this continual line then of ancestors and of people who, who can inspire, of trying to find inspiration in a similar way to we talked about with the myths and the legends and the stories. But here it's, it's closer to home. It's these people are of your blood. They're your lineage. And so you can go out and extend that. You can take it forward. And actually, there was one book that I also read, which was The Odyssey. And sort of in, in the same, at the same time of these. And there's an idea within The Odyssey of Telemachus, the son of Odysseus, who is saving a culture, who remembers and is told how great his father was, particularly by, by Nestor and I think it's Athene, who comes and gives him the divine inspiration. And then he goes off and tries to live up to it. He tries to be his father but his virtues, he tries to be the virtues of his father, to constantly improve upon the previous generation. And that's a similar idea here. It's the idea of exposing the culture, exposing the best of the culture, and trying at once to revivify it, but also to maintain it, to prolong it, and to keep it going. So we have that idea about where a culture comes from, where the ideas can come from, in terms of legend and myths. But how do they then come about? How do those legends and myths initially start? And a sort of response to that question is the one that comes from the Medicis, but also from the Russian Revolution. In the Medicis in particular, or sorry, in Florence in particular during the Renaissance, but at times it can be that Florence and the Medicis are one and the same, we see that there is a, a tendency for the best to come from chaos, from suffering and from external pressures, from the other states within Rome, but also from France and from Spain, and at times the Ottomans. And then there's also an internal competition. So competitions to be the best artist, but who is going to get the right to design a fresco for a statue, who's going to get the commission? And through that competition, which is also seen in ancient Greece with the, with the tragedies, there would be competitions to see who can produce the best. A almost suffering aspect to it, but a us against them aspect nevertheless, you against the rest of your competitors. But by doing that, it managed to produce great works, the best that really have ever been. And there was, an, well, perhaps also considering ancient Rome, and I understand that's a matter of taste. However, I think arguably they are some of the most sustaining artworks and sustaining pieces have come from the Renaissance period. But we see that between the classical world and the world of the Renaissance, those thousand years or more than a thousand years in between, 
there was a dearth of culture. There wasn't any great literary work written, any great art, any great architecture. And yet you wonder why this time frame, or why it took so long to get through the Dark Ages and then to enter that Renaissance. And depending on who you ask, there are suggestions that we are living in the Dark Ages in terms of beauty, in terms of aesthetics and culture. And at times you can see that, but at other times there are attempts from small sections to revive classical values. And whether is there always a necessity to go back to the classical values? Again, the idea of saving a culture, of revivifying it, taking the best bits forward and applying that to the modern world and the modern technologies that we have. So there is this chaotic and suffering aspect that breeds great cultures. And at the end of Herodotus, there's a story about, I believe it's about something that Zeus said, but the, the crux of it really is, is that soft countries, he said, breed soft men. It is not the property of any one soil to produce fine fruits and good soldiers too. The Persians had to admit that this was true and that Cyrus was wiser than they. So they left him and chose rather to live in a rugged land and rule than to cultivate rich plains and be slaves to others. So we see within this, there's an idea that you do need to go through suffering to become strong. And that when the times get too comfortable, then weak men are born. And there's a sort of, I don't know if it's a meme or idea that's going around the internet, that hard times breed strong men, strong men breed comfortable times, and comfortable times breed soft men. And those soft men then breed the hard times again. And so you have this cycle. And that was certainly seen within the Medicis. When you had this suffering, when you had this competition to produce the best art, however, when it got too comfortable, it was simply opulence. There was no beauty attached to it. It was just living in luxury for the sake of living in luxury. Not because you wanted to get away from some suffering, but because that was all you knew. And then they became soft, they became weak. And this is where it, it ends up with that, true, with that truism, that when the times become too comfortable, when it's too soft, cultures get weak. And perhaps that is something that can be analogous to the West at the moment, perhaps. But it also takes place in an individual's life. If they are spoiled by their parents, if they have everything that they could possibly need, why would they want anything? And why would they want to go out and work and earn and achieve something? Everything is already on a platter for them. So if we are too comfortable, if everything is given to us, if we don't have to work, to struggle, to suffer, then we do become soft. We do take too many things for granted and are unwilling then to go and achieve it or go out and seek by ourselves. We see then if we turn away from ancient Greece and the Renaissance to well, staying in Italy but with ancient Rome, that the moment ancient Rome really found its identity was when it was invaded by Hannibal in the Second Punic Wars between Carthage and ancient Rome. The famous story about Hannibal marching his elephants over the Alps and going around and sacking most of Italy. However, he didn't win and he didn't get far because at a moment in time, the Romans realised that Fabius, who was one of the generals in charge of the Romans army, Rome's armies, that it was his cool-headedness, his willingness to let Hannibal have whatever he wanted, let him destroy farmland, let him sack cities, and we'll bide our time, we'll wait, and we'll pick off men where we can. And that strategy was a turning point for Rome, and the moment when it really found itself and defined its identity as being cool-headed, is not rushing into things, not trying to be brash, but taking its time, wearing down the opposition and relying on its endless supply of resources in terms of men, but also eventually in terms of money when it controlled the entirety of the Mediterranean. So we see how that was again, a moment of suffering, a moment of chaos. However, from that Rome's identity was born, Rome managed to defeat Carthage control the Western Mediter Mediterranean and then turn to the East and eventually take all of that, going through Greece, Egypt, etc. So there is again an example of how suffering breeds triumph. If you can identify what will get you through the suffering, what the system is that will get you through the suffering, then once you get to the other side, you will find that you are stronger and better for it. However, that chaos can also turn into a, a darker and a worse side. And in Thucydides' history of the Peloponnesian War, we see what could be called the first revolution, and that's the Corcyron Revolution, where there is 
well, there were two competing governments, the oligarchs and the democrats, and one trying to dispose of the other. We see that there is just brutality on the streets. There's just wanton violence, chaos that breeds violence, not chaos that breeds any greatness. And perhaps we can see the first instances of why this chaos bred violence, because it set up an us v them mentality. Diff but it set up an us v them mentality within that we both have different rules. When we looked at the Medici's and in terms of the internal us v them at least, in terms of I'm trying to win a commission as well as all these other people, then we see that there's rules to this chaos. There are walls around it and the chaos is taking place internally. They still know what they're trying to achieve. They're trying to complete a great work of art for a commission, for someone who is requesting it. So they are playing the same game, really. But when we have something in Korkaira with the Democrats versus the oligarchs, and then when we look further and we look at the Russian Revolution, where we have the White and the Red Army, we see that they're not playing the same game. They have no similarities with the other person. They just want to get rid of them, and they are taking revenge upon them. So when we have this mixture of chaos and revenge, when you don't identify at all with the other side, which is what there was a lot of uh, dehumanisation in terms of discussions around the Russian Revolution. So the Reds, Lenin, the Bolsheviks, calling the bourgeois and the middle class former humans, dehumanising them to allow anything that they want to do become permissible. And having that aspect, having the clash and the complete lack of identification with the other side, then when there is chaos, that is what will breed this violent, revenge-filled slaughter, essentially. And so we can perfectly see how this destruction at Korkaira then led to the, the Russian Revolution that we had. And taking this to the... or linking it back into the idea of cultures and how on the one hand chaos creates, but on the second hand chaos destroys, we see that that was very much the idea behind the, the Russian Revolution. And at the end of Anthony Bieber's Russian Revolution and Civil War, he discusses a, a folktale. And it was a folktale by the writing critic Viktor Shklovsky, or the comparison that he made. And he compared the Bolsheviks to the Devil's Apprentice, who, in an old Russian folktale, boasted that he knew how to rejuvenate an old man. To restore his youth, he first needed to burn him up. So the apprentice set him on fire, but then found out that he could not revive him. And we see that really when we look at any revolution, but particularly the Russian Revolution, is a sense that when you get rid of a culture, you still need to replace it with one. People need cultures, traditions, meaning. Which is why perhaps at the time when we look at the famous Nietzschean idea that God is dead, what's going to replace him? And Nietzsche posited that now we need to find our own morality on an individual level, although trying to extrapolate that to a societal level, clearly it's never going to work. However, just taking that idea that God is dead, and so now we need to find new religions, whether that is within sport, whether that is within social causes, social justice, our political parties, however we want to define it, we still need something to tie ourselves into, to worship. And culture and tradition is an extension of that. It's the sort of biggest or the largest overview of this idea of a binding force, religion being a component of it. So when the, the Russians went about destroying culture, even to the extent that eating with a tablecloth is bourgeois, so if you do it, then you must be bourgeois. You've got to get rid of that because we're going to be absolutely nothing like them. And when they wanted to get rid of all ideas, sort of carte blanche, and there's another idea, there's another part or a story from the Russian Revolution where a family who were living in a manor gave it over to their peasants and they said to them, don't destroy what's already yours. We're giving you the manor, we're giving you the property. And yet the peasants destroyed it anyway because they didn't care. It was all about tearing down these symbols and these idea of the old regime, but forgetting that they needed to replace it with something. And it's evident when you read Lenin's state and revolution that there was no plan. It was destroyed, but what then? And he even talks about how Marx didn't indicate what happens when the state disappears. What is there to, to create? And you have to wonder whether it was just a blatant disregard for human character and human personality that the ideas that they were putting forward would never work. That we can 
the state will disappear. I mean, everyone voluntarily does the does the work. You know, uh, does the work to their ability. So they voluntarily do what is their ability, and they voluntarily take what they need. But until that point, there needs to be very strict state control. Until that point occurs, and obviously we all know that point is never going to occur. It doesn't work on an individual level. It doesn't work on a family, familiar level. It doesn't work on the community level, and it certainly wouldn't work on a national level. So obviously there will always be this need for strict government. And so then the question becomes, is it just a ploy and a grab for power? Or is there something really to it? Was it ignorance? Or was it more malicious? And that's the the questions that, that comes from that. However, there is an interesting example of their attempt to create culture. And this comes from the, from the funeral rites. And that communist funerals were very different to the rather gloomy farewell of Russian Orthodox rites. The writer Isaac Babel, serving with Bidjonis Konarima, Konamia described how dead heroes were hailed at the graveside for pounding the anvil of future centuries with a hammer of history. And so within that, we see that there's a lot of similarity, really, with the, the example of Roman funerals that was in Polybius's histories, in terms of celebrating the virtues of this person, how they are creating a new world, how they are creating a new and better world. However, these ideas by themselves are not sufficient. There are multiple aspects to it, as was found within the Medicis, the creation of art, the creation of literature, the move away from the monopoly of information that the church had, the creation of personal libraries and the printing press, the rise of humanism as a school of thought. And it was all of these multifaceted areas. It wasn't just that you will find your identity within work and within creating industry. That, that's not sufficient to bring identity to people. But when you compare it to the Renaissance artwork and people believing that they were citizens of Florence and of something to be proud of, we see a very stark contrast in what it takes to create a culture. It's not necessarily that something can be planned by humans, but it's something that can come from chaos. Whereas the chaos of the revolution, of the Russian revolution, descended immediately into violence and then strict order was put upon that. And for a culture to emerge out of that is, is very difficult because they evolve that tree and it's not really one man who can who can who can bring that about and so when we go back to that folk tale of the devil's apprentice believing that he needed to burn the old man but then realize he couldn't rejuvenate them we see again the contrast with the ideas of a preservation of culture which was what the renaissance was fundamentally going back to the classical ideas but then more concretely within the book the odyssey within telemachus reviving his father's culture, saving him, not allowing him to die. He didn't destroy and then rebuild. He built with the foundations that already existed. And taking this then forward into morality and principles, and also within morality, eloquence and courage, we see the, I suppose the best place to start with building on from the Russian Revolution is in terms of principles. And there was a common theme through all of the books on the classics, so Herodotus, Thucydides, and Polybius, that it doesn't matter what the person, what your enemy is deserving of. What matters is what you believe is appropriate to do. You should stick to your principles, not allow the external world, the rest of the world, to define you. So if someone has slighted you, if someone has done something against you, the immediate thought is not, they deserve this, I'm going to do exactly the same thing back to them, etc., etc., or I'm going to escalate this, but not to do what is beneath you, not to lower yourself to that, but to maintain your principles, to maintain your good character, and to go forward with that. And that was certainly a, a common theme within this. And to take that further and to compare it to other, other works and other ideas, is the idea of playing God. Is that who am I to exact justice? Who am I to know that this person should be punished for something they did to me? I'm not the sole source of justice. And it's something that we saw in Frankenstein. We can see it in The Count of Monte Cristo. We can see that even in Thomas Aquinas, in the work of theologians, is the dangerous idea of playing God. And who are we to do that? Is it incumbent upon us that we can say, no, this person certainly did wrong and they are deserving of this on an individual level? It doesn't... 
it doesn't ever seem to go well when we look at it in in literature but also in history and and in real life however there is a necessity for when we are under attack to be able to be courageous to be able to be brave and that within Thucydides the idea of that wise men should be able to to fight and so he said wise men certainly choose a quiet life so long as they're not being attacked but brave men when an attack is made on them will reject peace and will go to war though they will be perfectly ready to come to terms in the course of the war so we see the idea within that that there is a necessity sometimes to go to war but not to get carried away not to go and destroy everything not to rape and pillage as some people can do during warfare all the way up until modern times but to maintain that control maintain that discipline and it's something we see also in in Henry V's speech in was his battle speech in Shakespeare's play Henry V where he says there's nothing that so becomes a man as modest stillness and humility but when the blast of war blows in our ears then imitate the action of the tiger stiffen the sinew summon up the blood disguise fair nature with hard favoured rage and there was a necessity to have this duality of man to be able to be peaceful to be calm but when the time is for war to be able to go to war and it's an idea that we see from Nietzsche it's an idea put forward by Jordan Peterson and it's an idea that we see often in the Bible is that there needs to be a duality going all the way back to the femininity and the duality of that the ability to create and to destroy we have this duality within man to one destroy the war side but also in a way to create and in the sense of that to be still and to be calm is if you look traditionally at forming the home the man arguably forms the walls of the home and then they create that safe environment for the children and for the wife to exist for the family to exist within so there is a not so direct creation aspect as there is for for women but certainly the creation of a safe space of a place that people can be secure to explore and to play which is essential for children to have so we see this duality between the core principles that you stick to but when they are transgressed or when a transgression is done upon you or upon people you love or upon your community or your country then to still have the capabilities to go to war the third very important aspect in particularly in the classical world is an idea of eloquence and that you should be able to speak well and if you cannot speak well then that is a failing upon your part it's not enough to have information but to be able to be to persuade others it's not enough to dispute and say no this person is wrong but to explain and prove how you are correct in the assertion that they are wrong and if you are not able to articulate it then you are as good as a person who was wrong in the first place and again going back to the odyssey which obviously is contemporary to these classical ideas is that telemachus is called upon to go and speak and he receives that divine intervention from athene and is told okay look you need to you need to go out he says no i can't speak i'm not good at talking but she encourages him she imbues him with the spirit of the divine and when he goes and talks to nesta nesta says to him you're clearly your father's son you speak so well a story again we see within moses is that god calls upon moses moses says no i can't speak i can't go and speak to the leaders of the israelites i can't go and speak to the egyptian pharaoh but god pushes him and presses him and eventually he does go and do this and there is an idea around eloquence that we see constantly emerging from the the classical thought and for me i think it's in part because we need to be able to organize our thoughts but once we've organized our thoughts in an attempt to move closer to the truth and holding the truth as a high value if not the highest value then being able to go and persuade others be able to go and share that because in ancient greece and ancient rome but ancient greece more so was that to be a key player within society you need to be thinking about ideas that affect society and you need to be able to go and state your case and state your claim and if you can't do that you're useless to the society so why would they want you and it's an idea that's lost in modern society there's no desire to to speak well to speak eloquently to be able to organize thoughts to speak at length perhaps you know we could argue that it's because of of text and that there is a lot more written communication and so if we think about the oral tradition that the the odyssey would have been constructed within 
then perhaps that is an, a, an explanation for this. And these histories, Polybius and certainly Herodotus, these are the first real writings that we have. So perhaps that is perhaps that has something to do with it, but it's it's hard to understand why this desire to elevate yourself in terms of that morality, to speak well, whereas some people almost have an aversion to speak well. They don't want to aim up, they want to aim down. And perhaps that is how society and culture is moving at this moment. Because you either run from beauty or you are drawn to it. You either want to speak well or you find it something repulsive, something that's of a a different class to you, a different perhaps a race to you, something that you don't think is really something that you want to aspire to, and that it's not your culture. And that can be a very damaging idea that people put forward that no, to speak well, to stick to the truth, that's that's for them. We don't want anything to do with them. We'll completely reject their values. Something that happened in the Russian Revolution. And we'll take up our own values. But the goal is not to just reject to get rid of, but to try and salvage the good, praise the virtues, take them forward and try and improve upon it. And that is something that we should always try to do and always try to remember. And then finally, just to look at the ideas of death, because I think they are interesting. We've spoken about the, the Soviet funeral rites, where they're trying to proclaim the values. There's also the same, again, within the the Romans. And this story is about legend, if we touch upon the Muscadines briefly, because I haven't at all is that there is a desire for death, for the glory of death, and so you can become one of those, not necessarily martyrs, but a legend, an example, a hero, to inspire future generations. And that was certainly seen within the Musketeers, but it was also seen within, I can't remember what it was, but which book it was, but it was the one survivor of Thermopylae. So I think it must have been in, I think it was in Herodotus. And the discussion that the one survivor of Thermopylae, which is basically the film 300, well, that was based upon. And he, in the next battle, is so desperate to die. He just wants to go out and be as heroic as possible. And he survives. And when they're trying to choose who's the best warrior, they say, yes, he was very brave. He was, you know, he had no care for his life. He was charging in the front lines and trying to kill as many people as possible. But they knew that he was doing this because he wanted to die. He wanted to be back with his the other 299 so in that instance we we see this strange very alien idea compared to what we would have today that there's glory within death have the last one just to look at is again from Herodotus and it was a minor point about the Thracians if I can just find it and it was talking about how they mourn when a baby is born However, when someone dies, they celebrate. When a baby is born, the family sits around and mourns at the thought of the sufferings the infant must endure now that it has entered the world, and goes through the whole catalogue of human sorrows. But when somebody dies, they bury him with merriment and rejoicing, and point out how happy he now is, and how many miseries he has at last escaped. And it's a very strange way of looking at the world, but that now the baby is born, there were so many potential sufferings that they could endure. How once they died, yes, they did go through some sufferings, but now they are free from that possibility. They are happier now, and look at all the sufferings that they didn't have to endure, that we predicted they may have when they were still a baby. It's a strange way of of looking at the world, and again, very alien to to how we live now, but interesting nevertheless. And I think it's these small nuggets of information and just valuing them, and then this culture it was central to them it sustained and why what was the idea and the logic behind them this centrality of suffering and perhaps it is because it's so powerful in reviving a culture in creating a culture because it is so powerful in, in creating strength and fortitude the necessity to go through suffering perhaps we'll never really know the answer to them they're all speculations and hypotheses that we talk about, but I don't think that changes it, even if they are merely legend, as Herodotus, I believe it was, who said that these legends inform, and just because they're legends, just because they're fiction, just because they're not true, doesn't mean that they can't help us, they can't be examples to our lives, and we use them going forward. I didn't expect all these books to relate, and perhaps they still don't, 
and perhaps you're the forced. But they do, in my mind, tie together. They do have interesting crossovers. Perhaps not the, the Three Musketeers. To be honest, I think the main aspect of that was love. And that D'Artagnan and Buckingham will really do anything for the love of a woman. They will go to the ends of the earth for her. And that is the central chivalry that they have within those books. Maybe they weren't the most loyal men or the most devo devoted. But they certainly, they certainly would go as far as they could. Perhaps similar to, to Vronsky and Anna Karenina is that they like the game, they like the shows of chivalry, but not necessarily actually having the prize, not necessarily actually settling down and being with a woman. Who knows? So those were some of the books I've been reading recently, some of the ideas that I've been thinking about and perhaps would like to delve into more. I hope that was somewhat informative. If you want to look at any of the books there in the description below, I would, I would recommend all of them. I think they're interesting to think about from a philosophical philosophical perspective and certainly the the Russian revolution just reading about that and the brutality of it and how harsh it was I think is it, it it changed the perspective and introduces those ideas of suffering I think it's important to read brutal books to understand how bad things can be perhaps simply only just be more grateful for where we are today of the ancient books I think the Poly Polybius was the most enjoyable Herodotus was, it's difficult to track because there are so many names of different places, different people, so it can be very difficult to, to follow, but the central ideas are, uh, as I've spoken about, interesting. How there's a moment within Polybius' history where he says that he's not just going to list a load of names of meaningless places and meaningless people, as that of, his, of no benefit to anyone. So I wonder if he too had the same experience reading Herodotus, but I think I read them back to back maybe, or at least within a, within a short time frame, and it was, it's always funny to see these interactions between contemporary authors, or authors occupying the same field. It, uh, it, I enjoyed the fact that he said that it was a waste of time, and sort of validated my, my feelings of that that I had previously. But, yeah, just an aside that of all the three of the classical ones, because they can be hard to read, I think Polybius was the, was the most interesting, although there are some laborious explanations of how the Roman army worked, and how the Senate functioned, but it does read very well. The best of the three for me, although, as I said, they're all interesting. Anyway, I'll leave it there, and I'll see you in the next one.